brought to you by the Get Go Cafe and Market, where they're open for business 24 7, Moan, and they serve hot, fresh food from the kitchen right back there. It's not the. What, what did you come up with a word for the rotisserie hot dogs? Uh, roll, roll dogs. Roll dogs. You <laughs> just made that dogs. up too. You <laughs> I did make that up. up. I coined that, man. That could be a good thing. Roll dogs. <laughs> well, not for them because they do a lot better than that. <laughs> they have really good food. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's let's talk some football here. And there's no way to talk football in Pittsburgh without talking quarterbacks. Yeah. At this stage of the game here, Moan, we are all, myself included, guilty of over analysis of silly little one-on-one drills and everything else here, please, please relay to the audience how terribly insignificant everything's been up to this point in camp, regardless of which direction it goes. It's con- it's body conditioning right now. That's, that's what it is. Getting <laughs> reps, taking steps, honestly, at getting better. Like you can get beat and still have a good rep. You know, and, and I know a lot of people take stock in the O-line, D-line, and backs on backers type of drills and what quarterback did what in each situation. And a lot of time the coaches have a bigger bigger goal than what you actually see in front of you. And, and a lot of time even the players don't even realize that. It was sometimes I had some terrible days at practice, and the coaches would be like, good day today. And I was what, 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 what did I actually do good? Mm-hmm. Well, your steps were better today. I know you focus in on that. And those are the parts of camp that allows you to build a team. And that's one thing I always kind of say is like you're building a team when camp comes around. So the day-to-day tracking of, you know, completions, who's getting what reps. I, I, and I know that with the quarterbacks has been a thing. Oh, Mason, number three now. Well, you probably want to see how Mason reacts to it. They probably want to see Kenny with a better with a better I group in front the of him. Exact same thing this week when Mason Rudolph was oh. number three and Kenny Pickett was taking snaps with the second team. All I'm thinking is they're just pushing Mason's buttons. Yep. And yep. please, you know this from the inside. This doesn't have to be speculation. You know they do that, and they they probably want to see Kenny with a better group. They mm-hmm. want to see okay is. There's some veterans on this offensive line. You're going to get better receivers right here. Let's see how you work right here with them. Can you make those same completions that you were making with this better group and what what should be better group? You know, because I'll be honest with you, the times that Mason had to come in, it was, hey, don't mess this up. So he's got to deal with that. Yeah, yeah. He's got to deal with giving the cadence. He's got to deal with not being so loud. And we, it was times where I know Coach T and, you know, uh, 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 Randy put him in situations where it was like, hey, go in there with the ones. And he he knew he was going the day of, but our reaction to him was, hey, get this kid up out of here, man. He's not been. And w- they wanted to see how he would act. Would he fold? And that's what this is. Yeah, th- that's the kind of stuff that they're looking for. It's funny. Um, just a couple days ago, out in Latrobe, and we're asking. Yeah. Mike Tomlin stands in front of the pack of microphones and cameras that's there every day, and he starts off by saying, "Man, this was a great da 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 da." It's some real general statement, right? Yeah. Okay. And then when he's asked questions, he'll proceed to say certain things that he didn't like or whatever else. And you're thinking, "What was great?" Well, yeah. what was great was what you're referring to there, which is the only thing that they're actually looking at. Mm-hmm. Which is was the, was the effort level there? Was the passion there? Were the things that are mostly controllable in place? Yeah, hundred hundred percent, and not just that. DK making it out with no injuries, making it out and with no fights, that. making it out with no stupidity. That's what a successful practice is. Because if you got everybody available, now they got Deontay. Still, everybody's available. It's like now we can build our friggin' team. Now we can get ready for the first preseason game, which happens next week. And I can't wait to see what it looked like. Yeah. Honestly. And again, quarterback battle gets real because now you can actually sack them. Now these picks, you kind of judge them on because the game is where it's at. DK, you've heard this before too. Some guys, man, they're just gamers. They're just gamers. In practice, they just are terrible. But guess what? That's not an excuse in the game, though. No, no. Uh, Where Mitch Trubisky is concerned more than anybody else here in this equation, um, he himself has acknowledged that there are certain things that you just try to do at this phase that you're not whatever. But at the same time, he's also had a whole bunch of incompletions. Yeah. Had 16 incompletions in a row at one point down by the goal line. These aren't great looks. Um, 
how much would he have to stink, basically, suck, yeah. suck in uh, order to not be the starter at Paul Brown Stadium? Um, I'm not adding relevance to it either, okay? I'm yeah, just, yeah this, I know. This is looking forward. Looking forward here. No. Looking for how bad would he have to suck, DK? He would have to go out there and just throw three picks in a game, uh, not know how to manage the game also, meaning running out of bounds when he shouldn't, uh, not knowing how to hand the ball off, not commanding the huddle. That's how bad he would have to suck. Like, it would have to be throughout the game, so much so that a change as far as getting a boost uh, from the players would be necessary. I'll be honest, that happened with us. It did. It was It was post- Mason getting hit, like knocked out. Oh, and yeah. we actually ended up making a switch DK to duck yeah, just to get some life out of us. Yeah, just You know what I'm saying? Yeah, functionality, <laughs> trust, all that and, stuff. Yeah. And so that type of stuff does happen. And I don't think they'll ever admit it, but that was part of, the, of why we had to go to duck for a little bit. It's just like, okay, you got to get out of your own way first. Like, that's why I said as far as Mitch Trubisky goes – his biggest thing is forget Chicago. There's no need to be reminiscing on that. Is is be where you are right now. You got stud wide receivers, a running back, and an offensive line is going to protect you. Protect yourself from thinking that you're not it. How bad would he have to suck, DK, though? About three picks, uh, down by 20-plus points with no life of the offense when you know there should be some life in it. Um, but even still, I would almost think they would give him a shot the next week to be the starter. Yeah. He just needed a new refresh. Yeah, there can't be any doubt, I would think, at this stage that he's the default starter and he would really have to play his way out of that something severely. When we come back on the Ramon Foster Show, more football. Welcome back to the Ramon Foster Show. Camp fights, which you referenced in the opening segment. Why? Why? Why do they happen, and why do coaches simultaneously, Tomlin specifically, seem to hate them and at the same time kind of embrace them in a weird way? Because it shows you competition. It can tell you a lot about a player's DNA on how they're willing to not get dogged out. You've seen guys, especially in the one-on-ones, back on backers or the running back is running down the field and he gives a little bit of a nudge to somebody when he shouldn't have. And if you one of those guys that take that type of stuff, you kind of can get looked over as a rollover. Like football is, a <laughs> Hey, I hate even using this word, but it's an alpha, like alpha sport. Yeah. You know, like you, you gotta be big dog and, and not just that you got to show that when actually challenging in those moments, coaches don't like it, but it's all right. You know, you don't want anybody punching helmets and breaking hands and stuff like that, but you need to have some fight out of guys that are being challenged, not just on the field, but honestly, as a as a man for the most part, DK, um, why do coaches hate it? Because of the risk of getting hurt. Why do they love it? Because it actually it amplifies a group. It actually gets them together. When anytime one of the OLs fall, everybody was there just because to show you're not going to mess with us. I don't care if he is a rookie. You fight him, you got to fight all of us. So it kind of brings you together. It adds a little bit of an edge to it. It gives you a burst. And I'll say this for the guys not fighting, it gives them a break. So <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> everybody gets something, DK. You feel me? Has anybody <laughs> seen the water? <laughs> That's what I was doing. <laughs> That's what I was doing if the running backs and the linebackers were like, hey, man, give me some, let me get some water. They'll be all right. Yeah. But it's it's going to happen. There's too much physicality going on. And if you, for visual, for the people that are listening on, on, on the podcast, have your hand mm. underneath my neck pushing my face back when the play is over, I'm going to swipe down on your forearm and I'm going to return the favor to you because you're not going to disrespect me when that's not a part of the game. Hands to the helmet, to the face mask, that's a penalty. Guess what? You're going to catch a penalty out here by getting a hand back. Yeah, that's – that's uh, what a thing it is to witness those things. What about Cam? Yeah. Cam Cam, oh Cam Hayward's in a lot of these things. Cam doesn't need to be proven anything to anybody. I, except, I, to, except to Cam, I think. And I think that's just simply what it is. 
Uh, I was told he he got kicked out of practice for the most part the other day anyway. Coach, Twice. Coach Dunbar Twice. had to take his helmet. Yeah. He had to take his helmet. And, and Cam's just a go-harder. I, I learned to, to practice against Cam's just like, he going to be him, just roll, fight his – I was about to get explicit. Get him back whenever you can. Let him know, look, I'm here just as much as you are. Um, I'd say this. He, he has nothing to prove on that field and camp. For him to be fighting, I don't <clears throat> get it, but – that's just Cam. You say it as is, and I know a lot of people hear it and be like, I love that. But you don't want your vets being the guy that's fighting because that sets the precedence for the guys behind them. Well, I saw him do it, so I'll do it too. You see, I go back to Kansas City after that playoff game in which Cam was outstanding again, which is yeah, he was. crazy to say considering the Chiefs put up 40. And, and I asked Cam – Completely straight face, completely whatever. I just said, how is it that you you just had the best season of your yeah. career at this age? And he said, in a very matter-of-factly response, uh, I don't have a choice. If, yeah. I don't, if I don't keep improving, I'm going to be out of here, which is, of Facts. course, insane. Now, yeah. to me, when Cam does stuff like this mm – -hmm. And I'm not making it sound like it's some big negative or controversy or whatever. We're just talking right, here, okay? No. All right. When he does stuff like this, it's Cam's yeah. way of saying to the group, I'm still here. Yeah. Understand that. I'm not a passenger. I'm not comfortable. Yeah. Neither should you be. I am still here as if this was my first or second year in the yep. NFL. I am going to bring the same approach. That, to me, is what that's about. It's almost, I, I, almost deliberate. Yeah. It is where he's constantly saying, "Not yet, yeah, not yet, absolutely not yet." And I, I don't, I don't blame him. He's earned that. And and again, when you got bigger goals to play this game a long time and be one of the most dominant forces to play in the NFL at that position, that's what you do. Uh, and I'll say this: maybe the guys before him have done it wrong, and maybe that's the issue. Maybe we get to an age where it's double digits or nine plus years and you say man yeah I've, I've had a good ride this has been real cool man That's and not <laughs> we accept that the door is probably gonna close a little bit sooner than later uh -huh. you're right that's not him that's a good attitude to have but i've always been of the mindset and you know how i rock is do it on the field and the thing is he does i just hope that his methods don't sh short him as far as not learning to preserve himself throughout camp. Well, and I think that's where you see Carl Dunbar take his helmet and you see other situations like that where you just say, hey, listen, it's fine that you're like this, but I need you 100% for Cincinnati, okay? Yeah. Plain and simple. That that punch to the head could be a jab for a sack or something, you mm -hmm. know? So, uh, hey, I admire it. He's still killing it. Um, and the coaches don't like fights either because they disrupt practice. You got to stop practice. Yeah, they got business to do, right? Yeah, we're, we're on the schedule here, man. <laughs> you yeah, know, so, exactly. Yeah, that's that's why. But they're, they're, I I like them. I fought. I'm not gonna act, act holier than thou. Mm -hmm. When we come back, the only segment that matters. Hey, Mo. Hey, Mo. Back to the Ramon Foster Show. The only segment that matters is the Hey Moan segment. And for that, we turn to a visitor here to our headquarters and shop downtown, and that'll be Dave. Come on over, Dave. Dave, Dave and not DeCastro. Just, just hey, Dave, Mon. no DeCastro. What's going on, just man? Dave, Dave, Dave Friday, actually. Uh, hey. Nothing. Uh, just happened to be walking around about town and uh, walked in, wanted to meet uh, a guy who I've admired for many years, Dan. Mm -hmm. uh, been reading his columns for a very long time. Uh, Good. but, uh, nice to talk to you today. Uh, absolutely. So question I got for you mm -hmm. is I've always been curious as to what a week in the life of mm -hmm. a football player is like, Dearness. cause you know, I know you have life outside of yeah. football and I know we always hear about those, uh, what do they call them? Those uh, football junkies. Yeah. And I know that not everybody is like that. So I've always been curious is what is the life? A week, a week in the life of okay. someone like yourself, like I'll give you a, a week of uh, during the season. Let's let's do that one, please. All right, all right. Post game, all right. Go home. Monday morning comes around, and we usually have film. 
I'd usually get in at about 10, 11 o'clock, get a lift in, uh, sit around for a little while, watch some of the tape, get some lunch, and then we had team meetings at 2. From 2 um, till about 5, sometimes 6 o'clock, depending on how long the tape is, we're at the facility. So I leave home at about 10, get back home at about 6, 6.30, depending on where you live at home, uh, live in the city. Tuesdays, player days off for the most part. Some teams do players day off on Monday. I've heard of some people doing player day off on Wednesday where they practice Monday, Tuesday, off Wednesday. We did hours on Tuesday. Tuesdays would be one of my what I call civilian days where I can just be a human being and not necessarily a football player. I'd still go in early and because I did my show in Pittsburgh, uh, the Tuesday call in. I do that. And then I go in at lift at about nine o'clock. That lift would be about an hour, hour, 15, hour and a half. Get some rehab, ice down, get some stem, stretching. And that was my day at the facility as far as it goes. When the time came to where we, we were able to watch film on iPads, I didn't have to stay at the facility all day to watch it or wait on CDs to or DVDs to be made so I can get film. Um, but after that, I come home, man. Me and my wife would go do lunch. We go to Home Goods or something like that. And I was able to see the kids when they came home. Those were my Tuesdays. Uh, when I had my show in Pittsburgh, also, I used to go to Nakama and do my player show. So I'd be at home with the kids up to about 6 o'clock. 7 o'clock, I would go to Nakama, do my show, and back home at about 7, 7.15. And the next morning was Wednesday. Wednesday is big install day. I'd show up to lift at about 5.45. Um, from then, uh, have breakfast, get more rehab, ice and stem, whatever I need to get done, some massage work, or just working out like the deep tissue stuff that we'd had going on in the training room. Great training staff in Pittsburgh. Uh, meetings start at 8. You know, have breakfast and meetings start at 8. Meetings go to individual. Then at about 10.45 is walkthroughs. Walkthroughs get done at about 11.15, back inside for lunch. Um, and then we have about 45 minutes to an hour 15 before practice start. Practice usually started about two o'clock, one or two o'clock, because it was in correlation with game day. Um, practice over at four post practice, we got meetings again. If you see the trending, the, the, the trend is a lot of film. Yeah. That's the separator from all other uh levels, is you have the ability to watch a lot of film. Then you go home, have dinner with the kids, family, wife. Everything is all fine. Watch a little bit more film at home. Thursdays come around. Pretty much the exact same method um, as in the mornings. Um, but Thursday would be a little bit more special team emphasis. So let's say Wednesday and Thursday pretty much the same day. Uh, but in the evenings on Thursday, we have our offensive line night. We all meet over Marquise's house, have dinner together, watch some more film, mess around with each other, just – hang back for a little bit. Friday comes around and we're on the practice field at uh, 1045 because coach lets us leave early just in case guys got to go get haircuts, do stuff with the wife before we go out of town for the road games, do stuff with the kids. You get done with practice on Fridays at about one, two o'clock and you got the rest of the evening for yourself. Saturday coming on travel day, we had to be there at 10 o'clock on Saturday morning. Saturday mornings roll around get to meetings, watch Friday's film, the dress rehearsal pretty much, have another walkthrough, and then we'd head to the airport to fly out of the team. Wheels were up at 3 o'clock. Get to the hotel, check in, get your room assignment, and then from there you have about maybe two hours to go get something to eat, and then it's film again, meetings again, and bedtime was 9, 45, 10 o'clock, everybody in their room for room check. Sunday comes around. Wake up, go to the stadium, play the ball game, rinse and repeat. That's the life. You got to lock in. Did, did you, you consider yourself a football junkie? I did. You did? Just, just for the simple fact that I think most players are when you are a little bit less than talented. And I say that, you know, side eye a little bit, and I don't necessarily mean it, but some guys just walk out of the bed and run a 4-3. Some guys can grab a basketball and do a 360. You know what I'm saying? Like it's – it no, comes natural for those guys. <laughs> but for, for guys like myself and majority of the league that want to work, I'll say that too, want to work, have to work, you are a junkie of the sport. I didn't realize basketball players watch film. My brother is a professional basketball, watches film. You know, and I'm like, what, what, what do you mean y'all watch film? I just thought y'all, he was like, no, nah, 
it's a full breakdown because to make it to those levels, and I was that way in college, you have to be a student of the game. You have to be a junk. Like the historical facts of it, you probably know more stiller knowledge than me. You might know more NFL knowledge than me, but as far as watching the game, breaking it down, seeing what's what, nah, I, I, I can hold my best. Uh, I can hold my, my my own against some of the best. Nice. Well, uh, thanks. I could probably sit here and talk to you all day, but uh, yeah. you got to go, <laughs> and I appreciate your time, and uh, really, I admire the transition you've made from your post-football you. career as well. Thanks for your time today, Mo. Absolutely, Dave. Have a good one. Yep. And DK, I think I think you might have I think you might have a message for us too, DK. By the way, Dave was awesome. You give that seat up again, DK. You're gonna be fired, man. Well, all I'm, I'm gonna be you. giving it up for about a week now, and that's the that's the mm. message. I'm heading overseas with my son. Uh, my family. I'm born and raised in Pittsburgh, but my family originally is from Serbia, and we still have obviously. Uh, a lot of family over there. I haven't been there in 20 years. Wow. And my son, who's 18, has never been there. So we're doing a thing. We were going to do this before the pandemic. And now we finally have a little bit of an opportunity here. That's so, nice. yeah, we're really looking forward to it. Good. Uh, to say the least. Well, what's the uh, signature meal, man? That's what I want to know. What are you going to have while over there? Uh, we're going to have some chivapchichi. We're going to have some uh, sarma. We're going to have, you know, we're going to we're yeah. going to go around Belgrade and do it right. You know, nice, nice, but nice, nice. You will be left in the eminently capable hands of Eddie Provident. Can't wait. Our Eddie's producer. Good. Yeah, we might go off the rails a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Just a little bit. Yeah, we might he, talk in jazz. He's over here. Ramon says you might go off the rails a little bit. If you do a smooth jazz episode, though, I'm 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 suing. <laughs> he gonna sue his own company <laughs> just to prove a point what a guy <laughs> no smooth jazz see the thing is, is eddie got this new mixer board here yeah and he can crank up the bass and cheat oh, well, i just wanted on the record that when we did our smooth jazz episode no one moved the bass knob okay go. that was authentic smooth jazz <laughs> There was no auto tune used. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mona. See you in a few days. See you, my brother. <laughs>